Saul of Tarsus, as he pursued his passion of destroying the Christian faith, had a surprise meeting with the living Jesus on the Damascus Road. His life was radically transformed. As I mentioned in the snapshot on Ephesians, on that occasion he asked two questions. Who are you, Lord, and what would you have me to do? Seeking the full answers to those two queries occupied the rest of Paul's life. In fact, many of his epistles can almost be divided in half, with the first part seeking to explore who the Lord Jesus really is, and the second part explaining what we ought to do as a result. Grasping the doctrine of Christ and practicing the life of Christ couldn't exist apart as far as Paul was concerned. But here's the irony. Without in any way minimizing the classic Pauline epistles that expound on these intertwined subjects, this one-page letter may do the best job, at least of illustrating, if not explaining, both the wonder of Christ's love and the practice of Christian grace. It is without doubt the Apostle's most personal letter, written about the same time as his magnificent epistles to the Ephesians, Colossians, and Philippians during his first confinement in Rome. Where else can such a treatise be found that matches this one, expressing Christ's love and forgiveness while modeling ideal Christian diplomacy in human relationships? Here's the backstory. A slave called Onesimus, whose name interestingly means profitable, robs Philemon, his Christian master, who's a member of the Colossian assembly. He flees to the big city of Rome, hoping to get lost in the crowd. Through divine providence, he comes into contact with Paul and subsequently becomes a child of God. What steps are to be taken now? Paul outlines them in deeply moving and touching terms. Notice the full expression of Christian forgiveness, befitting one who himself had been forgiven much by God. 1. The offense is plainly stated, essential to a clearing of the matter. Onesimus had not lived up to his name. Unprofitable he certainly had been. 2. Onesimus returns to his master, willing and ready to set right his affairs. 3. Paul doesn't want Philemon's forgiveness to be coerced, but willingly offered. But there's more. Christian forgiveness looks for the opportunity to outdo the often grudging and conditional forgiveness of the world. This is to be forgiveness worthy of the Christ we serve. Through his intercession, Paul introduces, one, the idea of substitution, saying he will pay back what the slave has stolen. Two, then he requests Philemon to accept Onesimus as one born, so to speak, out of Paul's spiritual womb, a son in the faith. This spotlights Christ's own words, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Number three, more than that, he suggests Philemon receive him now not as a returning slave, but as a brother beloved. In fact, not any brother, but as if it was receiving Paul himself. Is there anything better than that? Paul, the master of superlative living, thinks there might be, adding, knowing you will do more than I say. How like the Lord's own graciousness this is. After all, he's ready to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. When someone has done you wrong, it might be good for your soul to read over this little letter and ask the Lord to give you grace to forgive the way you've been forgiven by God. And that's a scripture snapshot of the little letter by Paul to Philemon. <laughs>